Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by bit-pay.com and Mt. Gox, mtgox.com and tradehill.com and usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN and Mezzy Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Bitcoin Show. This is episode 33. My name is Bruce Wagner, as you probably know. Today is a sad day for Bitcoin. The um, site, the very famous uh, e-wallet site called MyBitcoin.com has apparently disappeared. It's gone AWOL uh, and all of its account holders' Bitcoins are missing as well. So. You may have already been uh, aware, if you're following the Bitcoin forums and twi- tweets and so on, that um, um, I disclose that Ed and I, my partner and I here in Only One TV and in life, uh, lost uh, over 25,000 Bitcoins. And you can do the math, it's a lot of money. Um, because of this um, horrible mistake on our part to uh, trust an e wallet service. This, this particular wallet service, at least, mybitcoin.com. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about what happened and what our thoughts and feelings are. Um, we discovered that actually, you know, I had been having questions about my Bitcoin for quite a long time, and I've been pretty public about, like, I am public about everything that I do. I tweet about it, I post forums, my, I'm very transparent, so you know what I'm thinking. Uh, and uh, Thursday evening, I went home. Actually, uh, Anthony Anderson, our host of the Anthony Anderson Show, was over visiting, and so Ed was there, and Anthony were there, and they were talking about something else. And I said, you know, something is bothering me. This my Bitcoin thing is really, really, really bothering me. I had this really weird intuition that something was wrong, and. I can't pin it on anything. I didn't know anything. I mean, nobody had told me anything. I had no experience whatsoever, but um, I just said, something's wrong, and I need to get our Bitcoins off of mybitcoin.com. That was Thursday evening. Um, Ed said, you know, well, let's transfer them. Let's just transfer them to Mt. Gox or Trade Hill or both. And um, I said, no, you know, we'll we'll get it set up with a secure system tomorrow, and we'll get it, finally get it done. We'll finally have time to take the time to create a secure system and transfer them all off. And we'll do that tomorrow. And uh, then of course, tomorrow was Friday and that's when mybitcoin.com just went down and disappeared. Um, I now know, uh, I'm told that um, I wouldn't have been able to move them off even Thursday night because um, apparently 24 hours, about 24 hours before it went down, mybitcoin.com stopped processing withdrawals. You could do a withdrawal and it looked like it went through, but it didn't actually happen. So they only accepted deposits and the withdrawals never happened 24 hours before it shut down. Then it just disappeared and vanished and the who is records changed and <clears throat> all of that. So um, obviously it was, a, it was a rough weekend. That's probably why you haven't seen me on camera since then. Um, it's uh, you know not only the blow of losing that much money personally, that's enough to really punch you in the gut hard. Um, the worst thing was uh, all of my friends, my family, my loved ones, people that I love most in life, um, that I had turned on to Bitcoin because, you know, I'm so excited about it and I share and I evangelize it. I admit it. I evangelize, evangelize Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> they bought into Bitcoin and they, they follow what I recommend. And so for the non-technical user, um, my Bitcoin is what I would suggest. And uh, they lost everything. So obviously I've had to, um, and I'm still having to, talk to each one of them individually and explain to them what happened and uh, explain to them that no, Bitcoin is not a scam, Bitcoin is not a fraud, Um, it's just basically uh, one site that apparently was. So I want to explain a little bit about this, my story from the beginning of this whole scenario. This uh, MyBitcoin.com was the oldest, longest standing Bitcoin e-wallet site in existence. If you're new to Bitcoin, you may not know this, 
but it had a strong record of stability. It, uh, Bitcoin itself was invented, you know, the, it, the Genesis block was something like January 2009, and from what I understand, my Bitcoin came on board around July 2009. I didn't discover it until uh, was it October or November of that year, so, uh, of 2010, that is. So, um, my Bitcoin itself, mybitcoin.com, had been around almost as long as Bitcoin itself. All right, so it's important to understand that. Uh, since nearly the beginning of Bitcoin, people who trusted using an e-wallet at all trusted my Bitcoin and they used it. Um, obviously, by now, the site had probably tens of thousands of account holders. Some of the smartest, most reputable, long-standing Bitcoin community leaders, the names that you know and trust, used mybitcoin.com, at least occasionally, and sometimes more, more than occasionally for larger amounts. Only two people ever complained to me, in all this time uh, that I've been involved, only two people ever complained to me about me listing mybitcoin.com on, on my site, bitcoinme.com. One was a very, very, very long time ago, and the other one was only very recently. Uh, neither one could give me any concrete right reasons why mybitcoin.com should not be trusted, other than I just have a bad feeling about them. Of course, at that time, that would be kind of like saying, I have a bad feeling of, about them, would kind of be like saying today, Mt. Gox, I kind of have a bad feeling about them. Because you might say, why? They seem reliable to me, they're still here, people trust them and use them every day. They had never given me or any other users any reason to believe that they were not reputable. Also at that time, almost none of the big players in bit, the Bitcoin world ever uh, had ever been public about their identity. Uh, at that time, no one I knew had ever met Jed, the founder of Mt. Gox. In fact, I was the only one I, I knew who had met Jed, yet everyone used Mt. Gox. Um, and, and no one I never knew, ever knew had ever met Mark, when Mark later took over Mt. Gox, and until his recent appearances on the Bitcoin show, no one ever had met him, yet everyone continued to use Mt. Gox, and still does. Being anonymous was the norm back then. In fact, I think Gavin Andresen and I were probably about one of the two or two of the only people who put our real names and faces out there in the Bitcoin forums back then. Even today, the vast majority of the forum members are, remain anonymous and don't use their names or their pictures. My Bitcoin was pretty much the only game in town. As far as e-wallets, if you believe that keeping your Bitcoins in an exchange site was more risky due to the popular theory that governments would eventually crack down on exchange sites first then mybitcoin.com was pretty much the only e-wallet game in town. <clears throat> the, um, not to mention, mybitcoin.com was by far the easiest and most usable e-wallet service. The only one with a simple address book, instant transactions, and was used by many reputable merchants as well for their merchant processing. In recent months, I tweeted on Twitter and made forum posts criticizing mybitcoin.com for their lack of a forgot password function. I speculated that that was their business model. Maybe that's how they're making money. That's a, a, a little shady, but you know, there have been worse situations, but they're using this uh, lack of a forgot password function as a business model to keep people's Bitcoin. And for, also for their lack of communication with account holders. They, since November, I hadn't heard anything back from them, although I had had uh, correspondence in the past with uh, Tom, the famous Tom, and more recently, I began posting, asking for suggestions for better alternatives to mybitcoin.com. Unfortunately, it was pretty clear that there really weren't any competing non-exchange e-wallet services back then until very, very recently, like in the last weeks. Um, there were many posts saying the same thing. We need a competitor to mybitcoin.com. Yet none appeared. Not in time. And even now, as new e-wallet services are suddenly springing up like weeds everywhere, they're all brand new and we basically know nothing about these people who are starting them. Even though I was critical of my Bitcoin, I was hesitant to come out strongly against them until I had a better solution to recommend. Unfortunately, for the totally non-technical user, there were very few other choices. And this remains true today. And this is a problem that needs to be fixed immediately if Bitcoin is to ultimately succeed. You have no idea how much I regret telling people about mybitcoin.com and how much I regret using it, of course. People are asking me, and no, I have not lost any faith in Bitcoin. Just because a bank was robbed, that doesn't show any flaw in the currency itself. 
only in our choice of whom we trust. I will remain an enthusiastic evangelist of Bitcoin, and now more than ever, a proponent of protection and security in all its forms. To those of you who have written to me, I want you to know that I feel your love. Your words of support and encouragement mean so much to me, I can't even tell you how much. Obviously, this is a major international issue. The FBI has been in contact with me. They ask that if you have been affected by this incident, that you contact the nearest FBI office to you, the closest inter or the closest international office. They have offices in many countries on most every continent. And ask for the Cyber Crime Division. And if you have any information or tips, you can also contact them. You can ask them to protect your identity if you choose. Also, Bitcoin community members have also asked that if you have any information or tips regarding this incident, that you can share them uh, that information pseudo-anonymously via the IRC network, Freenode, on channel Bitcoin-Police, and or tinyurl.com slash mybitcoin. Again, that's IRC network Freenode on channel Bitcoin-Police, and or the website at tinyurl.com slash mybitcoin. The good news, there are applications under development which will handle wallet security the way you would want it handled, the way it should have been designed from the beginning if Bitcoin had been mature when it was born, giving you, the user, total control of your own wallet, backing it up in a highly encrypted form, and giving the central backup site or sites absolutely no access to your wallet at all, ever. So now I'd like to talk to you in the chat room. I know um, you've been very patient waiting for uh, the show to start today, but I want to, uh, to discuss this with you and uh, see if you have any questions or anything you'd like to, uh, to talk about. So uh, give me some questions and uh, let's chat. I understand you're sorry for my loss, yes. I mean, like I said, um, <clears throat> you know, my loss uh, financially, money comes and goes. I, I've had lots and lots of money, and I've lost lots and lots of money, and I've made it back again. And um, luckily, if you work hard and you're smart, you can do that in no time. So I don't, I'm not emotional really about losing the money. I really, you know, it just doesn't really phase me that much. But what I'm emotional about is talking to my best friends, my friends and family that, um, that trusted me. Uh, they put their faith in me, blindly really, and um, did what I recommended. And uh, I made a big, big, big mistake by ever talking about mybitcoin.com. You know, I, I view it that um, Bitcoin is in its infancy, as we know. It's kind of like the, the gold rush um, there are, um, you know, we've just discovered gold, there's a gold rush on, everybody's mining, suddenly, you know, everybody's getting rich in these small western mining towns, and um, they don't know what to do with the gold, so now there are stagecoach heists happening, and then there are bank robberies, and we're going through all of this in these early pioneer stages because we're realizing that Bitcoin is not a bank. Bitcoin is not something that is regulated and can be controlled and reversed and so on and so on. So it's really like, it really is just like cash or Bitcoin. I mean, cash or uh, gold or silver in many ways that if, it, if it's cash, it's irreversible. It will absolutely be a target for theft. You know, people talk about stolen credit card numbers and I always wonder like, what difference does it make? I really wouldn't care so much if my credit card number was stolen. It's all reversible anyway. You check your bank statement every day and you just report it and it's done. And it's so simple because banking lets you reverse everything. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about literally like a vault full of gold. If it's gone, it's gone. And that's what Bitcoin is. So we're realizing this is a fundamental difference in, in the money of the world. Bitcoin is so different in its nature. We're not used to that. So we are learning that um, the number one priority um, for Bitcoin as far as its usability is security. How come you had so much Bitcoin in, in my Bitcoin? Didn't you make tutorials on, mm, on how to create a secure wallet? Yes, I had planned to. You know, 
we're very busy around here. We're, we're in a launch mode of a new network. We have 31 shows we're launching with. I mean, there's no excuses. Do you have a will? I mean, you know, it's one of those things where you know you should do it and you say, well, first thing tomorrow, it's going to work its way up to the priority list. Um, you know, you start out with a few Bitcoin and if you buy it at 20 cents, it's really not that much money. <clears throat> but then, you, you know, you know how it is. In the last six months, you turn around and it's like, holy moly, there's a fortune there. That's a lot of money. And you're like, damn, we better do something about this and let's get right on it. So let's put it on our to-do list. But, you know, there's no excuse. It's just like anything else in life, you know. Do you have insurance? Do you have your will done? Do you have, you know, you, do you have funeral arrangements made? I mean, these are things in life that everybody should do. And in hindsight, of course, it would have been nice if they had done. But we don't. Life goes on. We get busy. There's no excuse. Um, and we learn lessons the hard way. And those are the lessons we never forget. So this is one that I haven't forgotten. Um, Let's see, what other questions are there? Give me some questions. How many, what is it? Uh, I should get a Bitcoin exchange. Should I get out of Bitcoin now that the exchange rate is below nine? Well, I'm not gonna give you advice on buy or sell, you know. I think that it is, um, it definitely is um, going down because of this. You know, people are realizing that Bitcoin has a flaw. There's not a flaw in Bitcoin itself or the Bitcoin network or the Bitcoin technology. There's a flaw in the human, um, human beings and the, the tools that are there to protect it. So it's, it's absolutely cash, it's absolutely reversible. And at first it was this cool, fun, wacky currency and it's all fun and games. And then all of a sudden, boom, it became extremely valuable. And now we've got vaults full of gold and you know, people just weren't prepared to protect it. And um, technical users, very, very, very technical users, as you know, if you've been following the headlines, the third largest exchange site in the world, the guy obviously must be pretty technical, and he made a mistake. And he deleted um, all the Bitcoins in the third largest exchange in the world, which was less, quite a bit less than we lost, as a matter of fact, but it's still devastating. Every single person who had funds on deposit with that exchange lost them. And that was a technical person. Okay. Um, the same thing with that, the, the other previous one, the guy who lost $450,000 worth of Bitcoin or something at the time. He was a technical person. He, mi he made one misjudgment about how the application dealt with the wallet and he lost, he accidentally completely overrode his Bitcoin. The thing is, if technical people can do this, how in the world do we expect the average user to do this? We can't. And that's why we need something very, very simple, as simple to use as dialing a phone number. It has to be absolutely simple and um, you know, not vulnerable to viruses, security, your own mistakes, dropping your phone in a lake. I mean, it has to be absolutely uh, as rock solid and, and reliable as Bitcoin itself. And it has to trust no one, absolutely no one except yourself. It has to be that way by design and it has to be open source so that people can audit it just like Bitcoin itself. Open source, transparent, and trusted. That's the only way to have high security in a technology like this. So we've learned a lesson the hard way, you know. Hey, if I'm your teacher, I suppose that's why I needed to learn this lesson myself. <laughs> and boy, have I ever. You know, when I have to sit down um, at brunch on Sunday and tell my friends what happened, you know I will never forget this, this experience. And um, you're gonna hear me preaching a lot about security, I'm just telling you right now. Um, the messages are flying by so fast. If Bitcoin becomes more legitimate, then it's more likely targeted governmental agencies. How can it be reconciled with the anonymous or regulatory? Yeah, if Bitcoin becomes more legitimate, then it's all the more likely to be targeted by government agencies. How can that be reconciled with the anonymous and the regulatory? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing. I mean, no, but that's the $64 million question, so to speak. Um, people don't know what's going to happen. Um, there are stances where people um, are on a campaign to become more compliant, new exchanges that are, uh, more and more new exchanges that are, adv you know, that are saying, we are the most compliant, we are absolutely compliant. And other exchanges that are saying, no, we're more compliant than you. And that that's the only way for it to, to um, you know, really uh, become widely accepted is to go completely mainstream and, and for total regulation. Then there's the opposite, people that are starting exchanges that they want to be more and more 
in the shadows and um, you know more and more anonymous and so on. Um, you know, both are happening, and who knows what will happen? I mean, the future uh, is yet to be seen. Unless you have a fortune ball, a fortune, t what do you, crystal ball? Um, we don't know what's going to happen, but. Um, both things are happening, and we'll see which one actually ends up working. The, um, uh, you know, <laughs> both directions are happening. That's the one thing that's, uh, again, beautiful about the technology of Bitcoin is that it can work both ways. It could actually be in a format that's completely as regulated as freaking, you know, Citibank or Western Union, but it could also work in a format um, that's completely anonymous on, on the down low, like mybitcoin.com, you know. Uh, where you're absolutely trusting an anonymous person who named himself, um, what, the second most common first name and the second most common last name in the world. Uh, doesn't this latest fraud and the fact that you had to run to the FBI... Oops, it's scrolling off. Mm, I missed it. There's so many questions <laughs> scrolling by here. Um, oh, doesn't this latest fraud and the fact that you had to run to the FBI for help show fundamental flaws in the liber libertarianism on unregulated markets? Interesting. Well, I didn't run to the FBI. <laughs> I could tell you that. Um, the FBI contacted me. I mean, it's already in the press um, before this show, obviously. It's already been in the New York Observer and it's been um, reported up well, from the forums. It's gone everywhere. It's all over the internet and in the press. Um, the fundamental flaws in libertarianism and unregulated markets? Well, no, I don't really think so because um, it's the same thing as if you had um, a whole bunch of gold bars in your safe, in your, uh, you know, your master bedroom. Um, if people know that it's there, uh, it will be a target and it'll be stolen. If you um, go down to the uh, bank, <laughs> a new bank that just opened, or maybe an old bank that's been there forever, uh, but the owner's never there. You don't know who it is. It's very shady. It's just a, an ATM only location and they have safety deposit box and you put all your gold in it and you have no idea who owns it. And then you go back, uh, you know, nine months later and all of a sudden it's all boarded up and nobody's there. The same thing could happen. Uh, obviously less likely with gold, but any, the point is that if you have anything like cash, gold, silver, something like that that's valuable and sort of untraceable, uh, more untraceable than banking, then it's going to be a target for theft. It's part of the nature of a cash-like system. These are all things we're learning the hard way. Let's see. Banks are regulated and insured by the FDIC. Yeah, they are, aren't they? They're, they're insured by the FDIC. They don't have any problem doing that because they can always print more money. If there's ever a shortage, they can just print more. Um, let's see. Yeah, Mezzi Grill. You know, the, um, this is also very painful that the, all of the merchants that I um, talked about Bitcoin to and evangelized Bitcoin to, they were all set up with my Bitcoin too. So yeah, Mezzi Grill lost their Bitcoin. Um, and um, they're down for the moment. But no, they have not lost faith in Bitcoin. And um, it wasn't because I had to convince them again or anything like that. Uh, Marwan at Mezzi Grill is um, like, this is not a flaw of Bitcoin. It's nothing to do with Bitcoin. It's just this one criminal website, this, this criminal uh, conspiracy behind running this website. And um, that really has no impact on Bitcoin or the future. And he realized that right away. He told me this. So no, everybody's still behind Bitcoin. The only people that are selling right now are probably the, um, the ones that are just not, they don't really understand Bitcoin. They just, somebody told them to buy it. It was a good investment and now they're getting scared and they're selling. But it, I believe that Bitcoin will come back. It's, um, if anything, when the price is low, it's usually a good time to buy. But um, I think that, you know, Bitcoin itself is not a flawed system. It really is a beautiful system. And uh, people realize that who understand it. People who don't understand it are um, just bewildered. They, they just, this is, to, to people who don't understand it, and, and a lot, which is like most of the media, they're gonna say, oh, Bitcoin again, another Bitcoin disaster. And people think that Bitcoin is about disasters and fraud and theft and so on. But, you know, you could say that about gold in the gold rush days, uh, that gold was about theft and robberies, because it was, <laughs> you know. 
That's what happens if you have gold and you're not careful about it, it's going to be stolen. Okay, let's see. Any more questions? Um, oh, Bruce, what do you think about Bud Dwyer's plan to about reversible uh, Bitcoin transactions to the protocol? I don't know. I, I really don't like that idea. There, there's a proposition to alter the... Pro uh, I, I'm interesting to hear what Gavin and the, and the technical leads on the Bitcoin project have to say about that, but I, I read that thread, and, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I don't like that idea at all. I mean, you start modifying it so that transactions are reversible, and you, you, just, you just have a credit card. You, you ended up with PayPal and credit cards again, and that means merchants are scammed. I would rather see... Um, better escrow services built in so that I send Bitcoin and um, when the person, uh, when I receive the goods, I release it and things like that. But I don't like the idea of uh, reversible transactions, no. That's just my personal opinion. I, I'd be interested to hear what other people think. Have you considered, let's see. Do you, uh, Bruce, do you think FBI can do anything about the My Bitcoin disaster? I have no idea. I've never, <laughs> I have no knowledge or experience whatsoever about the FBI or their resources. I mean, I only know what I see on CSI. I mean, that's about the limit of my knowledge. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, I mean, I've heard that they've been able to track down people who've created viruses and things like that. So I would imagine that a lot of it has to do with uh, how many people were harmed and to what financial ex extent it was. So that's why they're saying, they're asking me to ask you, if you've been affected by this, to contact your local uh, FBI office and ask for the Cybercrime Division and explain to them, uh, you know, the, the situation with MyBitcoin.com because if they hear from 10,000 Americans or and foreign foreign nationals as well because there are FBI offices all over the world and if they hear from 10,000 people even if it's a small amount uh, I have a feeling they might reprioritize their um, their efforts but as far as you know I, I can't predict what they could possibly do about it let's see mm. <laughs> Crazy questions. I want to call Interpol. Okay. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. How many Bitcoins have your friends lost? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think we've totaled it up. I mean, for, I don't even know what all their balances are, you know. Um, it's just, um, it's devastating. I mean, obviously no one I know had more Bitcoin uh, in my Bitcoin than I did, you know. And in fact, you know, People, I'm so transparent that when I was um, questioning my Bitcoin, I mean, that might have actually, uh, you know, scared them and made them decide that it's time to uh, take the site down because uh, of sort of, a, you know, speaking out loud and telling them my thoughts that this might be the time that I would withdraw my funds. So now's the time for them to shut it down and run. My, uh, are you concerned about Trade Hill Mt. Gox being insolvent after the 1.5 million U.S. dollar dollar chargeback fraud? 1.5 million dollar dollar chargeback fraud? Well, I don't know, but where are you getting that number 1.5 million? I'm not sure about that. Um, Trade Hill said something like $37,000 they lost in last month and another 10,000 this month or some, something like that. Or was it 37 altogether? $1,000. Um, I don't know. I, 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 uh, I'm not privy to know exactly those numbers, but, um, you know, it's, um, who knows? <laughs> Trade Hill said 1.5 million. Are you sure? Hmm. Um, I do not know about that. I don't know really about their solvency, but you know, this is something that, um, I mean, pretty much I've always said, this is not new, I have pretty much always said, I, when I go to a currency exchange, like if I, if I got back from London with a whole bunch of British pound and I wanted to exchange them for US dollars, I would walk into the currency exchange and I would exchange my pounds for dollars and then I would take them home. I would not leave them there. So, you know, I've always been a pretty outspoken advocate for not using an, a currency exchange as a bank. 
they are not banks and um, they're not supposed to be used that way. The, um, uh, you know, so I, I just, I would take your, you know, your dollars or your coins in and, and ex exchange them and then take them out. I mean, there's no reason to store your wealth in an online service, I mean, especially an exchange site. You know, and that's the thing. I, I've always advocated not storing your, uh, your wealth in an exchange and therefore, you know, well, that, like I said, because people were saying that, you know, the exchanges would be targeted before anything else. My Bitcoin was safe because um, it's Bitcoin only. So it's, it's not going to be under the scrutiny of a government attack, at least not in the first lines. And so my Bitcoin would be safer than an exchange site. There were a lot of people who expressed that opinion. And it's, you know, it, it made sense to me. <clears throat> So, oh, okay, so they're estimating the total of all the exchanges. Yeah, who knows? That Dwala fiasco is another one. I mean, there's been a lot of problems, haven't there? Um, how did they contact you? What, what, again, FBI, how did they contact you and what did they ask? Well, <laughs> my phone number is right there. I mean, if you just look at the bottom of the page, click contact, and you've got my phone number too. Everybody has my phone number. Um, are banks safer than Bitcoin? It depends. It depends on the bank and it depends on where you put your Bitcoin, doesn't it? Um, are you going to, wait a minute, buy name gold? Okay. Let's see. What else? What else? What else? How will you pay back your friends and family? Yeah, good question. Not with Bitcoin. Have you talked to Mt. Gox about the theft? The guy's probably selling them there right now. Yeah, well, a lot of people have said that, uh, you know, they're, they're watching for a big sell-off. Um, but um, I've also heard the theory that um, if you think about it, if this was the intention of MyBitcoin.com from the very beginning, if you think about it, if this was their intention from the very, very beginning, then, of course, they would remain completely anonymous from the very beginning. And wouldn't it make sense that they would have been selling it? This is theories that I've read in the forums. Wouldn't it make sense that they would have been selling it as soon as you deposited it? That, you know, you, you deposit the money and the Bitcoin and they were, the theory goes that they were selling it almost as fast as you deposited it. So they could have sold it all over the last two years. Almost, by the way, you notice almost two years to the day it was up, um, the two year anniversary. And if they were selling it all along, it will be more difficult to, uh, to trace. And, you know, they, their sale of it would have happened in the past, not now. Uh, let's see. No, this will not affect the conference. You know, um, if you want some good news, the, um, you know, Ed and I had invested in Bitcoin, obviously, and um, we were trying to maintain that investment by not selling it. So our lifestyle was a lifestyle where we refused to sell it. If we could at all avoid it, we were not going to sell it. And um, therefore, we've been living with, without selling it. So it hasn't affected our lifestyle or our income. At the same time, oh, someone asked about, it, will it affect the conference? And no, the, the conference was designed to not to make a profit, but not to lose, just to break even. So we have um, you know, tried to, to make the admission um, you know, two bitcoins, which is like about 25 bucks. Well, now it's like 18 bucks. Uh, then uh, so affordable that, you know, it's less than a movie theater ticket in this city. So we wanted to make it very, very affordable so that not every, no one would be turned away because they couldn't afford it, hopefully. And um, vendor tables are only 10 bitcoin, um, which is what, like $90 today. So we're trying to make it extremely affordable and uh, yet uh, not make a profit and yet not cost anything either, not be a loss. But um, if it paid for itself, that's, that's our goal. So no, the loss of our Bitcoin shouldn't affect that. Mm, interesting question, okay. Bruce, you say Bitcoin is a currency. Can you name one other currency that has had this kind of extreme volatility without the monetary system breaking down into a barter system? Well, Bitcoin is... Uh, is a currency, it's a cryptocurrency, obviously, but it's not like any other currency in the history of mankind because um, 
it's obviously completely different. It's not issued by any central issuing agency, not any government or company. Um, it's not uh, centralized, so no one can print more of it. It's volatile right now because it's new and it's scary um, for good cause. Um, let's see, wouldn't banks be safer than Bitcoin? Whoops, scrolled off. I gotta catch up here. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Banks would be safer than Bitcoin. It, you know, like I said, if you, yeah, if you store Bitcoin in mybitcoin.com, then a bank would be more secure, wouldn't it? it? It, you know, would gold be more secure than a bank? Would a bank be more secure than gold? It depends on where you store your gold. Depends on what bank you bank with. Some banks have ended up insolvent as well. Bruce, none of the Bitcoins have been moved out of my Bitcoin's wallet. Do you think Tom Williams might just be dead? Or he might just be very uh, shrewd because if the Bitcoins are still in my Bitcoin's wallet, then I doubt that he's dead. I, I just, I really doubt that he's dead. If someone died, they would certainly find the records um, of what he was maintaining and it would come out. Um, if they haven't been moved out of his wallet, it's probably because he knows that um, they can be traced. Bitcoins are not anonymous, as has been brought up many times. If you, you know, if you had, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin and you knew they could be traced, what are, what are you going to do? You're going to buy alpaca socks with them? I don't think so. Um, he's probably pretty shrewd. And if that's the case, let's see. Does it bother you that everyone involved in Bitcoin? No. Um, <laughs> does it bother me that uh, everyone involved in Bitcoin is a scam? No, because it's not true. <laughs> um, only a few people are. And, um, you know, it only, it's just like anything else. It's like, does it bother you that uh, everyone who uses cash is a drug dealer? That's an absurd question. So let's see. What else do we have? Even insolvent bank deposits are insured by the FDIC. Why do you deny that it's a huge difference between FDIC insured bank and my Bitcoin? Oh, I don't. I don't deny that it's a complete. Di it's a very different. Um, that's a huge difference because um, the FDIC insures bank deposits, and they can do that because they can print all the money in the world. So yeah, that is more definitely safer. Like I said, Bitcoin is completely decentralized. It is your responsibility as a Bitcoin user to know how to protect it. You know, many, many people have failed at that, including me. And um, so it's completely, completely different. Um, but, you know, if I could just print more Bitcoins anytime I wanted, then I could cope in a bank and FDIC insure it as well. I could, I could Bruce Wagner insure it because if any, against any losses, I can just print more Bitcoins and give them to you. But that's a difference. You can't really compare it. Bruce, what site are you going to use now? <laughs> I'm not going to use a site. I'm not going to store my, uh, my Bitcoin on a site. We're going to talk about that in upcoming episodes. Stay tuned because we're going to be talking a lot about security. You're going to get sick of hearing about security, but there are lots and lots of things that you can do to secure your Bitcoin in three different types of amounts. One is what you would carry around, amounts that you would typically carry around town in your pocket. And the second being amounts that you would typically keep in your checking account for your, you know, day-to-day -day expenses and like monthly bills and things like that, online shopping and such. And then the third is what you would keep in a savings account or IRA or investments, uh, basically what you would consider your wealth. Three different categories and three different categories of security. And we're going to talk about that in great length in coming episodes, trust me. Uh, let's see. Bruce, what do you think about this rumor of my Bitcoin was an attempt to discredit Laissez-faire capitalism by George Soros. Okay, no idea. <laughs> uh, let's see. What was your my Bitcoin receiving address? We can help monitor the thief. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think is it still on the on the donation page? If you uh, click on our contact us um, on onlyonetv.com, click on that contact us tab. It's probably still on that tab. But don't send any Bitcoin to it, obviously. But um, we'll record it before we remove it from that page. Well, that needs to be done today. You hear that, Manny? Uh, how will this affect Only One TV? It's not really going to affect Only One TV because, like I was saying, Only One TV is uh, 
like the conference, is designed to be self-sustaining. We receive income from our sponsors, and we are very grateful for that. So um, our sponsors support Only One TV. Uh, Ed and I's personal Bitcoin investment did not uh, subsidize anything, really. Um, uh, I guess a little bit at the very, very beginning. And, uh, but since then, we had uh, been on a no-selling um, policy, so um, it wasn't sustaining us. You know, so thank God for that. We uh, only one TV is self-sustaining. So speaking of the sponsors, keep giving me some good questions. And uh, Manny, you get on the on the moderator track here. Let's keep the chat room happy and friendly. And uh, let's just take a real quick moment to uh, thank our sponsors who who bring us to you every day. We're here every weekday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's New York time. And um, <clears throat> we thank bit-pay.com. We call it BitPay, but I say bit-pay.com because I'm going to make sure you go to the right place. BitPay is really cool. They're uh, our newest sponsor. They are revolutionizing online Bitcoin merchant shopping carts. It's so cool. It's kind of like the, um, I don't know, the PayPal button or the Google checkout button for Bitcoin. And what's brilliant about it is you don't have to know anything about Bitcoin. Um, you can be any merchant who just says, I have a website and I want to accept Bitcoin. Whether you are a sophisticated you know, web designer where you have the, already have a sophisticated uh, shopping cart solution in place, if you do, it integrates into your um, actual uh, existing shopping cart. If you don't, then it will, um, it has its own built-in uh, you know, kind of stripped down, but very basic shopping cart. You can see it if you visit the uh, conference site about the uh, world's first Bitcoin conference and World Expo coming up in two weeks. Go to bitcoinconference.com, all lowercase, bitcoinconference.com and check that out. And you'll see an example where you click register now. That is uh, bit-pays button so that you can actually buy an admission and, and or a vendor table and so on using it. And you'll see how brilliant it is. And what's really cool is that they, um, they've made it so that a vendor who doesn't know or a merchant who does not know uh, anything about Bitcoin necessarily, uh, totally non-technical, can actually enter their bank account number and all that. And they can use CH regular US dollars right into your bank account. So you can accept Bitcoin um, like, you know, the, the customer pays in Bitcoin, and you can ex either accept Bitcoin or U.S. dollars without any uh, issues at all. It's just uh, absolutely brilliant in its simplicity. And John Johnson's saying, Bruce, do you genuinely believe in BitPay.com, or are they something that just scrolled off? I genuinely believe in them. Um, you'll try it out, and you'll see. I mean, I don't accept sponsors that I don't believe in. Um, I really, really don't. And... Um, we are using them for the conference specifically for that purpose because it's, um, you know, they've been on the show, we know who they are, and they don't hold your Bitcoin. In fact, uh, I didn't give them a Bitcoin address fast enough and they were, you know, really nagging me because they don't want to hold onto your Bitcoin for more than 24 hours. They want to just receive it and send it right on to you. They're very, very um, upstanding and um, reliable and super easy to use. And everyone who has seen it has been really impressed. So we're really happy to have them as a sponsor. And MountGox.com, everybody knows, MTGOX.com. I mean, it almost goes without saying, Mt. Gox has a vast majority of the market share of online Bitcoin purchases. You can buy Bitcoin, sell Bitcoin. You want to know the price of a Bitcoin, where do you go? Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox has been around the longest, and um, they have been hacked like big banks have, too. But they are resilient. They're here to stay. They are still the number one exchange site. And uh, we've met them. They show us their face. Um, Mark's been on the show several times now. And um, we really appreciate them being here and sponsoring Only One TV and the Bitcoin Show. And TradeHill.com, the second largest exchange site, TradeHill.com. The, uh, they're new. Um, they're revolutionary. They offer multiple ways to get the money in and out. They have a US dollar exchange and a native euro exchange now so that you don't have to convert your euros into dollars and then convert them back into euros on the other end. Um, so tradehill.com is um, making, you know, making new strides in what you can do with an online exchange. So again, we thank them for their support as well. And usgoldcoins.com, 
1-800-HOT-COIN. That's our buddy Andy Gauss. He's a monetary expert, guru extraordinaire. He is, um, if you want to diversify your investments and invest in rare gold and silver U.S. coins, otherwise known as numismatic gold and silver coins, he's the guy to talk to. He's an expert. Actually, if you have any type of question about money, he's the guy. Very accessible. If you're in the U.S., just call 1-800-HOT-COIN. Ask for Andy. Andy Gauss. He's the man. He's, um, we've been fans of his radio show for years, and we, you know, he's been, we've been a customer of his, and he's been over to our place for dinner, and he's now bringing one of his radio shows on Wednesdays here to Only One TV. Very excited about that. And he's one of the original sponsors of Only One TV, and we're very, very appreciative of Andy Gauss. And um, I have referred friends to him that have, like a, a friend who was uh, in foreclosure and he wanted to know something about uh, advice that he had, uh, I had heard Andy say on his radio show. And I said, just call, just call Andy. And he called, my friend called him. He didn't even tell him that he knew me or anything. Just called 1-800-HOT-COIN and asked for Andy. And Andy, he said he spent like 30 minutes talking to him and giving him the, the best advice and helped him save his home. That's not his business, though. <laughs> his business is selling rare gold and silver coins as an investment. But I, I totally stand behind him. He is uh, absolutely the most honest, uh, genuine guy I've met. And Mezzy Grill. The famous one and only Mezzy Grill. M-E-Z-E Grill.com. You can check out their menu and the, the beautiful pictures of the location. It's uh, like an upscale Chipotle, um, but it's not Mexican, so don't get any burrito ideas. This is authentic Mediterranean food. It's absolutely delicious, super, super healthy, and it was one of Ed and I's favorite places, and that's why we ended up um, you know, falling in love with the food, and we ended up meeting the owner and hanging out and becoming great, great friends. So we told him about Bitcoin, and of course the rest is history. He then became the world's first brick-and-mortar restaurant I guess what other kind of restaurant is there? Anyway, the world's first restaurant to accept Bitcoin. And now, recently, the world's first rest, uh, retail establishment, as far as we know, to uh, buy and sell Bitcoin for cash. So they are, um, and even after this, my Bitcoin fiasco, which yes, they did use my Bitcoin, uh, and yes, they did lose their Bitcoin. Even after that, they are Bitcoin evangelists, uh, and they are in it for the long haul. So we thank them. So, we are back, <laughs> and uh, tell me, tell me, guys, uh, what other questions do you have, or whatever, uh, what other comments or um, topics? What else do you want to talk about? Who is Matthew M. Wright? Do you know him? No, I don't. He seems to be a new face in the forums, promoting something like a better business bureau for Bitcoin, but it's very strange because it doesn't. It seems to be like brand new and nobody's really behind it except this person, Matthew N. Wright. So I have no idea what that's about. I, you know, I, I would be very, 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 very skeptical. And more now than ever before of anybody that is a new, new on the scene and spamming, basically spamming, you know, uh, oh, there's this new way you visit this website and you can uh, mine bitcoins you know, and, uh, or this new organization. When you go to a website and, and you look, always look for the contact us tab and look for the address and the phone number and Google a phone number, Google the address, find out, is this like a rent -a desk place, a PO box? Is it a, a real phone number? It's very, very easy to use Google and find out a little bit about something. But most importantly, you know, do, do business with people that you've seen here as guests on our show, where they're, they're not afraid to show their face. You know, we, we really only do business, well, especially now, more than ever, we're recommitted to only doing business with people that actually show their face. Um, there's really no need to um, deal with dark shadows. Um, it's just not necessary. There are enough people in Bitcoin now that you can do business with people that you are, you know, in your own country at least, and have, um, you know, have a face at the very least, that you know their face, you know where they live, you know that they're around. Um, and again, when it comes to your Bitcoin, make sure that you store it yourself. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to be t discussing this at length in many, many upcoming episodes. So make sure that you subscribe and uh, stay tuned as we go into all the details about how to, how to uh, uh, you know, protect your Bitcoin. Ellie says, Bruce, how do you plan, uh, wait, what did she say? How do you plan to get your revenge? <laughs> 
Well, I'm not into revenge. Um, I don't believe in that. I don't think that way. Um, you know, I really, it's, it's actually, you know, you might think it's a funny question, but actually it's a very important question because I'm not the type of person who believes in revenge. I believe that people, uh, people who do things like this are miserable people. They will end up, um, basically their own life will be their punishment. I mean, I don't believe that people need punishment. They um, make mistakes and they learn because their life will be miserable. So in a sense, you can think of it as their life itself will be their own punishment. You know, if you're a thief and you steal millions of dollars, guess what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna, you hang out with other thieves and as soon as you blink, they're gonna steal it from you. And you're gonna end up with much, much, much worse than having your money stolen. You're gonna have a very miserable and probably short life. So I don't, I don't think that way anyway. I don't think about, um, you know, uh, revenge or getting even or anything like that. I just say, you know, easy come, easy go. Life is short. Um, money is just money. It can come, it can go. Nobody died, as far as I know. Um, we have our health and all that stuff. And we're very, very, very smart, talented people. We will make that money back in no time. But um, these guys won't. They'll get it stolen and they will probably have a very very miserable life and um, and I don't take any um, joy in that it's just a fact I think that's kind of how it works I mean some people call it karma but I don't think of it as karma so much as just um, lessons learned and everybody's at where they're at on their journey and everybody has their, their own lessons so when somebody you know says something horrible to me it really I know that it has nothing to do with me it has to do with them it, they're just broadcasting where they're at on their journey when somebody commits a horrible egregious crime or something against me or theft or something like that it really does nothing to do with me it, it really tells the universe where they're at on their journey and uh, like I said I'll make the money back in no time they will probably not um, unless they somehow make amends with with themselves and their spirit and the universe and all that uh, no it doesn't want to get revenge either he we, we were like-minded in this let's see what else do we genuinely believe in it? yeah okay let's see we need some chat room moderators don't we don't ask the same question a thousand times let's see what else um you don't support keeping your money on exchanges what do you think of mount gox's withdrawal limits then well uh, mount gox has the apparently mount gox has their reasons for the withdrawal limits you know i'm sure that it has something to do with you know, governmental regulations. They have many customers in the United States, and if it's less than a thousand dollars a day, I, I'm assuming that there are some kind of regulations that um, uh, apply. If it's more than a thousand dollars a day, and things like that. So, in their way, I think that they're doing it probably more as a uh, compliance issue to make to prevent themselves from becoming a target to be shut down. Um, also, you know. It's, uh, it has protected them in a way. I mean, you can't deny, nobody likes that. If you have, you know, whatever. If you had $100,000 in Mt. Gox and it took you 100, uh, whatever, 10 months to withdraw it because it's $10,000 a month limit last time I heard without ID. Of course, you can present your know your customer ID and all that. But if you wanted to stay anonymous and it took you 10 months to withdraw it, it would be very annoying, I'm sure. But on the other hand, uh, it apparently has prevented a lot of their losses because when they got hacked, if they hadn't had that limit, they would have lost everything. So in a way, it's a security measure. They didn't, you know, they didn't lose it all because of that. Let's see, what else? I saw another good question. Um, <laughs> Do you think privatized regulatory agency would work for Bitcoin? A privatized regulatory agency? I don't know what that is. What, what is a privatized regulatory agency? Like a private, I mean, you mean like a um, uh, consumer, like a seal of approval or something, a better business, uh, something like that? No, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't think so. Because if it's privatized, then it's just a private organization and you'd have to voluntarily become a member. Like the, what is it, the consumer electronic seal of approval or something like that. I mean, it's, a, it's okay, but I think that most people just really don't pay enough attention to things like that. It's more about deciding who you can trust and how much you can trust them with. 
and what cities can I use Bitcoin to pay my bills? Well, it depends on what your bills are. <laughs> you know, um, you can buy a lot of things with Bitcoin nowadays, more and more every day. Mm -hmm. How do I make my job? How do I make my money? Do you have a regular job? This is my regular job. I mean, you may not believe it, but I actually am a talk show host. And we have sponsors, and they sponsor us. So that's, uh, that's what pays the bills. Uh, you can keep your dollars and da -da -da. breaking bad. Uh, an agency in charge of investigating. Let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. Am I per? How are you? What? How are you personally? Are you okay? Yes, I'm personally okay. I'm all right. You know, like I said, it was devastating. I can't deny it was devastating. The, um, you know. Not one of my better days <laughs> this past weekend. I slept like three hours the whole weekend, um, mostly thinking about my friends. And um, so, uh, but I'm okay. I'm all right. My friends are wonderful, wonderful people, very loving, very understanding. And they thank God they don't blame me. And um, life goes on. Um, do you think stores will start accepting Bitcoin soon? And if so, how will they decide how much their own items uh, worth? their items have in Bitcoin. Well, you know, these are the, th yes, of it's going to happen real soon. It's already happening. We've got Mezzi Grill in Manhattan. We have Hudson Eatery in Manhattan. We have Oak Crepes Restaurant in Brooklyn. We have um, a couple of Metro PCS dealers here in Manhattan. You'll see if you come, go to bitcoinconference.com and in two weeks you come here and you'll see many businesses that are accepting Bitcoin already. And if they use these things like uh, BitPay and so on, they will actually be able to price their items in U.S. dollars um, on the back end, and it'll display the prices up to the minute in the current Bitcoin price, so the merchant doesn't have to worry about that. So, let's see. Um, any more questions? I think... You haven't heard about Hudson Eatery? It's Hudson Eatery. You spelled it right. H-U-D-S-O-N Eatery, E-A-T-E-R-Y, HudsonEatery.com. They're not a sponsor yet, but we're going to get them. But yeah, Hudson Eatery is the second uh, restaurant in Manhattan to accept Bitcoin. Of course, I told them about it. Um, I guess I haven't talked about it too much on the show. Maybe you missed that episode. But Hudson Eatery now accepts Bitcoin too. And um, you come to the conference. We'll be having lunch at Mezzi Grill. We'll be having dinner and cocktails and icebreaker things, uh, parties at Hudson Eatery. You'll see all these places. So make sure you go to BitcoinConference.com. Uh, buy your ticket right away and uh, buy a vendor table and so on. And we're going to have the most amazing melding of the, the most brilliant uh, players, the movers and shakers in the Bitcoin world are all converging on New York City. They're coming, they're literally flying here from China, Africa, Australia, Central, South America, New Zealand, um, everywhere. And uh, we're really, really looking forward to that. It's going to be a blast. So we're out of time, but uh, thank you all. I, I do feel your love. I really, really appreciate your letters and um, your comments. Um, and I really appreciate that you, uh, that you care. And uh, we love you. All right? Thanks. We'll see you tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, every day, Monday through Friday, The Bitcoin Show. Take care.